Fire Emblem, a vast series with a long continuity and an even greater history. As the series gears up for both its 15th and its 16th installment on the near horizon, many people are asking what Fire Emblem games will these new entries take after. While 1 is a clear remake, FE16 is very much in the dark and we have no pure information onto its existence. Which has led to many fan speculations as to what it just might be. In order to gear up for any new Fire Emblem game, I always go through and replay every single other Fire Emblem game that I can. And with Echoes on the near future, I think it is time to consider an age-old theory amongst the Fire Emblem community that we have long held firm. Is there a concrete Fire Emblem timeline? Well, today, I will hopefully find the answer to that question. While Fire Emblem is held together by many continual plot threads, themes, and ideas, as well as continual gameplay elements, these things do not a proper timeline make. And as such, it has led to us scratching our heads as to where exactly every game fits on the timeline. The simple answer is, there is no concrete Fire Emblem timeline, at least not yet. We don't exactly have any equivalent of Hyrule Historia to tell us otherwise so it is naturally left up to fan speculation. Now, what we do know, however, is certain games uh, take place on similar continents and have similar settings. As such, you can draw up a simplified timeline that looks something like this, having three specific timelines as well as two games that do not fit on any of them else, those being Sacred Stones and Fates. This is what I like to call the Outrealm timeline. Now, Obviously, with these three timelines here, you have the primary timeline where a good majority of the games take place, following from FE1 all the way through to Awakening. This is the Akinian timeline. The Akinian timeline including games FE1, FE2, and FE3, and Awakening. This timeline harbors around the continent of Akania, Arcanea, or whoever you translated the game decides it to be written. This is, of course, the primary timeline and the one where the series' mascot himself, Marth, exists on. This is where a majority of the events take place and has one of the deepest and most fleshed out lore. Below that are the Judgrel, Elive, and Tellius timelines, each with two games on each side. These, of course, refer to Judgrel, Elive, and Tellius, respectively, three additional continents that take place somewhere within the Fire Emblem world. And finally, the Outrealm timeline, which contains Sacred Stones and Fates, which at the current time do not fit on any of the other timelines. Now, this is obviously seemingly complicated and very odd to look at, especially when you consider there are three to four major timelines depending on what you look at. But, if you actually take the time and notice some of the hidden details, you can determine that there are actually really only two timelines plus the Outrealm timeline, but we'll get into that later. So, firstly we need to figure out how to connect everything to the Akinian timeline, as that is the easiest way to start creating a solid block. Firstly, we should start with Judgrel. Thanks to Awakening, we can fairly easily say in good confidence that Judgrel takes place within the same confines as Akinia and Valentia. This, of course, is determined by the presence of the Dead Lords in Awakening as summoned by the Grim Leal. Again, more on the Grim Leal in a second here. The Dead Lords in, who are summoned by the Grim Leal wield a vast array of weapons relating to genealogy of the Holy War, most of which being the Holy Blood weapons passed down through the generations of the Twelve Crusaders. Additionally, the Dead Lords appeared in both Theresia 776 and Genealogy of the Holy War in their final chapters respectively. 
The presence of such powerful undead beings being summoned by a similar group, the Glimlil and the Lopto sect, makes me think that these are in fact the same dead lords. Including the, of course, Latinized names as well. These being the same dead lords and carrying the Judgralian weapons, specifically the most powerful weapons in all of Yudgral, I of course point that to connection straight away to genealogy of the Holy War. Additionally, there is of course the archetype of Grima. Grima and Loptir share many, many similarities. Namely in the fact that they are both large, supposedly draconic beings who have a dedicated cult to them. Additionally, they each have dark tomes and possess a family line specifically designed with the idea of inheriting the dark god as a vessel. This is in fact very similar, and we can chalk this up to a language differential. In fact, I'd almost argue that Grima and Loptir may not be, in fact, the same creature. While that is still up for debate, the similarities are completely undeniable, and who's to say that in Akinian Common versus Judgrel Common, that Grima and Loptir are not the same word. Again, that's going into linguistics and delving deep into possibly fan-fictional territory, but I feel I should mention the connections at a symbolic level at least. That connects Judgrel to the Akinian timeline. Now, given that, I would also say that Judgrel must take place many, many years before the sealing of the Earth Dragons and Medeas. Mostly because the history of Judgrel is so well chronicled that noting the existence of Akinia in the timeline would be very, very difficult. As such, I believe that Judgrel and its events take place long before that of Fire Emblem 1, and in fact, long before that of the hero Henri sealing Medeus in the initial incident that sparked the events of FE1 several hundred years after that point. Now we need to connect Tellius to the Akinian timeline. Now, this is going to be a slight more difficult task than connecting Judgrill. Tellius, for example, has this problematic lore bit known as the Great Flood. The Great Flood, of course, caused by the goddess Ashunera, later splitting off into Ashira and Yun. Now, this becomes an issue because it is specifically stated within this bit of lore that all continents except for Tellius were wiped out. Perhaps this is not as literal as it means. Perhaps it means all continents within sailing distance of Tellius were wiped out, isolating it in that regard. While this is grasping at straws, I feel it's a detail I should mention. What we might also want to look at is how the geography of Acania and Valm has changed since it was once called Acania and Valentia. Thanks to Awakening, we know what happened to them long after the events of FE1, 2, and 3. And if we actually compare the geography, there is actually a quite a bit of difference. Notice especially how on Valm, this island to the south of it is a lot smaller in Awakening when compared to that of Gaiden. This, I believe, is actual physical evidence of rising and lowering sea levels that affected both Valentia and Acania. There are tons of also little differences between the continents that you could also chalk up to rising and lowering sea levels. This, of course, references that the Great Flood might not have reached as far and wide as we may have once thought. Additionally, I feel it to mention that within Tilius, there is also the mention of Ike at the end of Radiant Dawn. At the end of Radiant Dawn, it is otherwise stated that Ike left Tellius forever in order to search for some new lands. He left with either Sorin or Ranolf depending on what his supports ranks were, but that's besides the point. The existence of Priam, who is now settled on Valentia, is very much evidence that Ike at some point ended up in or around Valentia before he eventually settled down to raise a family. Since Priam is all but confirmed to be Ike's direct descendant, we can infer that because of this connection, we believe that Priam is indeed in Valentia, not because of any Outrealm bullshit, but simply because his family was somehow displaced there at some point via natural methods of travel. Simply put, 
Priam is in Valentia because Valentia is somewhat near Tellius in terms of sailing distance. Sadly, I am unable to connect either Sacred Stones or the Elib timeline to the Awakening timeline. Now, this is for a few reasons. Firstly, there are no direct references to Elib or Magvel within either Awakening or Radiant Dawn or Path of Radiance, all the games that would have succeeded them in terms of release dates. Meaning that there is no way to connect them. The closest thing to any direct con confirmation of Elib's existence within any point of the Akanian timeline or the Tellius subdivide timeline is the presence of the vague Kati in Radiant Dawn and Path of Radiance and the Soul Kati in A Paralogue of Awakening. Now, before you go on me and say this is evidence, you of course used the holy weapons of Judgrel earlier as an excuse for why Judgrel exists in the Akinian timeline. Well, it's not so simple. You see, there are far more Judgrel weapons than Alib and Tellius weapons that are present within the Awakening timeline. However, the most crucial ones which appear in Awakening, those being practically every weapon of the Twelve Crusaders and the Rognell itself, all appear within the confines of Awakening's story. While there are also plenty of Alibian weapons that appear within Awakening's DLC, namely those of the Einhar cards, I cannot say that this is in fact evidence of their existence on that timeline, since we are talking about the presence of those weapons within an Outrealm. Awakening has these weapons, namely the Rognell and the Judgrel Holy Weapons, existing within its story. While you could also make the same case for the Solkati, you cannot however say that for the Armads or any of the other weapons that appear in the Awakening DLCs. And thus, I cannot connect them in that way. Additionally, this is the same thing with Sacred Stones, as while well, plenty of the s rank Sacred Stones weapons appear in Awakening as Regalia, they are not obtainable throughout the main story, nor seen throughout the main story wielded by any of the Dead Lords, etc. All that leaves is Fire Emblem Fates, and thankfully for Fates, we can easily fit it into the Akinian timeline as we could with Tellius and Judgrel. Namely because of the Before Awakening DLC, the Hidden Truths DLC, and the presence of the characters Laszlo, Odin, and Selina. As I said earlier, DLC does not co confirm any information, but I feel like Fates is a special case in this sense. As Laszlo, Selina, and Odin are all appearing in the main story as well as the DLC chapters that highly market them, meaning that the Awakening Trio, in fact, is direct confirmation of existence within the Akinian timeline. And I think this helps. Now because of this, we have also determined that Fates exists on a somewhat uh, split timeline as well to the Akinian timeline, not directly involved with it, but close to it in terms of the size and strength of like how distant an Outrealm it is. It's got to be very close with this much travel between it and Akinia. In that sense, I can also make the inference that since Judgrel and the Continent of Fates are not present nor referenced in any future games, or games that are future relative on the timeline, that they were most likely, as with Tellius, wiped out during the Great Flood. This also helps to retcon the fact that Fates is not mentioned during Awakening, although it is mentioned during the Before Awakening DLC. Additionally, Krom describes the kingdoms of Hoshido and Nor as being legendary. Now, the only other things referred to as legendary within Awakening refer directly to Naga, Grima, the first exalt, and the time before then, i.e. Marth's time. Meaning that Fire Emblem Fates must take place before or around Marth's time. In fact, I'd argue it almost takes place before the Great Flood. In fact, it has to take place before the Great Flood. In fact, I'd actually put it somewhere between the time of Judgrel and the time of the Akinian Saga, long before the hero Henri initially sealed Medeus. Well, there you have it. That is what I think the Fire Emblem timeline looks like. 
Well, it is a bit rough and there are several holes to this theory, please tell me down in the comments what you think of it and what could be improved. I am always open to criticism and consideration, so please tell me what I've got wrong, tell me what I've got right, and I will gladly be able to discuss it in the comments with you guys. Thank you for watching, and I hope you learned something more about Fire Emblem today. I have been Zerk Monster Hunter 4, and I will see you all in the next video. Happy hunting!